Section 5 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 5. Problem 4. The Grotto Spectre. Part 2. I had risen above the shock which such a death following such a bench would naturally occasion even in one of my blunted sensibilities, and was striving to live a new life under the encouragement of my now fully reconciled father. When accident forced me to re-enter the grotto where I had never stepped foot since that night, a favorite dog in chase of some innocent prey had escaped the leash and run into its dim recesses and would not come out at my call. As I needed him immediately for the hunt, I followed him over the promontory, and, swallowing my repugnance, slid into the grotto to get him. Better a plunge to my death from the height of the rocks towering above it. For there, in a remote corner, lighted up by a reflection from the sea, I beheld my setter crouched above an object which in another moment I recognized as my dead wife's missing slipper. Here! Not in the waters of the sea or in the interstices of the rocks outside, but here! Proof that she had never walked back to the house where she was found lying quietly in her bed. Proof positive, for I knew the path too well, and the more than usual tenderness of her feet. How then did she get there, and by whose agency? Was she living when she went, or was she already dead? A year had passed since that delicate shoe had borne her from the boat into these dim recesses, but it might have been only a day so vividly did I live over this moment of awful enlightenment all the events of the hour in which we sat there playing for the possession of our child. Again I saw her gleaming eyes, her rosy, working mouth, her slim, white hand loaded with diamonds, clutching the cards. Again I heard the lap of the sea on the pebbles outside, and smelt the odor of the wine she had poured out for us both. The bottle which had held it, the glass from which she had drunk, lay now in pieces on the rocky floor. The whole scene was mine again and as I followed the events to its despairing close, I seemed to see my own wild figure springing away from her to the grotto's mouth, and so over the rocks. But here fancy faltered, caught by a quick recollection to which I had never given a thought till now. As I made my way along those rocks, a sound had struck my ear from where some stunted bushes made a shadow in the moonlight. The wind might have caused it, or some small night creature hustling away at my approach, and to some such cause I must at the time have attributed it. But now, with brain fired by suspicion, it seemed more like the quick intake of a human breath. Someone had been lying there in wait, listening at the one loophole in the rocks where it was possible to hear what was said and done in the heart of the grotto. But who? Who? And for what purpose this listening? And to what end did it lead? Though I no longer loved even the memory of my wife, I felt my hair lift as I asked myself these questions. There seemed to be but one logical answer to the last, and it was this. A struggle followed by death. The shoe fallen from her foot, the clothes folded in her room, my wife was never orderly, and the dimly blackened wrists, which were snow-white when she dealt the cards, all seemed to point to such a conclusion. She may have died from heart failure, but a struggle had preceded her death, during which some man's strong fingers had been locked about her wrists. And again the question rose, whose? If any place was ever hated by mortal man, that grotto was hated by me. I loathed its walls, its floors, its every visible and invisible corner. To linger there, to look, almost tore my soul from my body. Yet I did linger, and did look and this is what I found by way of reward. Behind a projecting ledge of stone from which a tattered rug still hung, I came upon two nails driven a few feet apart into a fissure of the rock. I had driven those nails myself long before for a certain gymnastic attachment much in vogue at the time, and on looking closer, I discovered hanging from them the rope ends by which I was wont to pull myself about. So far there was nothing to rouse any but innocent reminiscences, but when I heard the dog's low moan and saw him leap at the curled-up ends and nosed them with an eager look my way, 
I remembered the dark marks circling the wrists about which I had so often clasped my mother's bracelets, and the world went black before me. When consciousness returned, when I could once more move and see and think, I noted another fact. Cards were strewn about the floor, face up and in a fixed order as if laid in a mocking mood to be looked upon by reluctant eyes. And near the ominous half-circle they made, a cushion from the lounge, stained horribly with what I then thought to be blood, but which I afterwards found to be wine. Vengeance spoke in these ropes, and in the carefully spread-out cards, and murder in the smothering pillow. The vengeance of one who had watched her corroding influence eat the life out of my honor, and whose love for our little Roger was such that any deed which ensured his continued presence in the home appeared not only warrantable, but obligatory. Alas, I knew of but one person in this whole world who could cherish feeling to this extent or possess sufficient power to carry her lifeless body back to the house and lay it in her bed and give no sign of the abominable act from that day on to this. Miss Strange, there are men who have a peculiar conception of duty. My father... You need not go on. How gently, how tenderly our Violet spoke. I understand your trouble. Did she? She paused to ask herself if this were so, and he, deaf perhaps to her words, caught up his broken sentence and went on. My father was in the hall the day I came staggering in from my visit to the grotto. No words passed, but our eyes met, and from that hour I have seen death in his countenance, and he has seen it in mine. Like two opponents, each struck to the heart, who stand facing each other with simulated smiles till they fall. My father will drop first. He is old, very old since that day five weeks ago. And to see him die and not be sure, to see the grave close over a possible innocence, and I left here in ignorance of the blissful fact till my own eyes close forever, is more than I can hold up under, more than any son could. Cannot you help me then to a positive knowledge? Think! Think! A woman's mind is strangely penetrating, and yours, I am told, has an intuitive faculty more to be relied upon than the reasoning of men. It must suggest some means of confirming my doubts, or of definitely ending them. Then Violet stirred, and looked about at him, and finally found voice. Tell me something of your father's ways. What are his habits? Does he sleep well, or is he wakeful at night? He has poor nights. I do not know how poor, because I am not often with him. His valet, who has always been in our family, shares his room and acts as his constant nurse. He can watch over him better than I can. He has no distracting trouble on his mind. And little Roger? Does your father see much of little Roger? Does he fondle him and seem happy in his presence? Yes, yes. I have often wondered at it, but he does. They are great chums. It is a pleasure to see them together. And the child clings to him, shows no fear, sits on his lap or on the bed, and plays as children do play with his beard or with his watch chain. Yes, only once have I seen my little chap shrink, and that was when my father gave him a look of unusual intensity, looking for his mother in him, perhaps. Mr. Upjohn, Forgive me the question. It seems necessary. Does your father, or rather did your father before he fell ill, ever walk in the direction of the grotto, or haunt in any way the rocks which surround it? I cannot say. The sea is there. He naturally loves the sea. But I have never seen him standing on the promontory. Which way do his windows look? Towards the sea. Therefore towards the promontory? Yes. Can he see it from his bed? No. Perhaps that is the cause of the peculiar habit he has. What habit? Every night before he retires, he is not yet confined to his bed, he stands for a few minutes in his front window looking out. He says that it is good night to the ocean. When he no longer does this, we shall know that his end is very near. The face of Violet began to clear. Rising, she turned on the electric light and then reseating herself, were marked with an aspect of quiet cheer. I have two ideas. 
but they necessitate my presence at your place. You will not mind a visit? My brother will accompany me. Roger Upjohn did not need to speak, hardly to make a gesture. His expression was so eloquent. She thanked him as if he had answered in words, adding with an air of gentle reserve, Providence assist us in this matter. I am invited to Beverly next weekend to attend a wedding. I was intending to stay two days, but I will make it three, and spend the extra one with you. What are your requirements, Miss Strange? I presume you have some. Violet turned from the imposing portrait of Mr. Upjohn, which she had been gravely contemplating, and met the troubled eye of her young host with an enigmatical flash of her own, but she made no answer in words. Instead, she lifted her right hand and ran one slender finger thoughtfully up the casing of the door near which they stood, till it struck a nick in the old mahogany, almost on level with her head. "'Is your son Roger old enough to reach so far?' she asked with another short look at him, as she let her finger rest where it had struck the roughened wood. "'I thought he was a little fellow.' "'He is. That cut was made by—' "'By my wife.' "'A sample of her capricious wilfulness. "'She wished to leave a record of herself in the substance of our house as well as in our lives. "'That nick marks her height. She laughed when she made it. "'Till the walls cave in or burn.' is what she said, and I thought her laugh and smile captivating. Cutting short his own laugh, which was much too sardonic for a lady's ears, he made a move as if to lead the way into another portion of the room. But Violet failed to notice this, and lingering in quiet contemplation of this suggestive little nick, the only blemish in a room of ancient colonial magnificence. She thoughtfully remarked, Then she was a small woman, adding with seeming irrelevance, like myself. Roger winced. Something in the suggestion hurt him, and in the nod he gave there was an air of coldness, which under ordinary circumstances would have deterred her from pursuing the subject further. But the circumstances were not ordinary, and she allowed herself to say, Was she so very different from me? In figure, I mean. No. Why do you ask? Shall we not join your brother on the terrace? Not till I have answered the question you put me a moment ago. You wish to know my requirements. One of the most important you have already fulfilled. You have given your servants a half-holiday, and so doing, ensured to us full liberty of action. What else I need in the attempt I propose to make, you will find listed in this memorandum. And taking a slip of paper from her bag, she offered it to him with a hand, the trembling of which he would have noticed if he had been freer of mind. As he read, she watched him her fingers nervously clutching her throat. "'Can you supply what I ask?' she faltered, as he failed to raise his eyes or make any move or even to utter the groan she saw surging up to his lips. "'Will you?' she impetuously urged. As his fingers closed spasmodically on the paper, it evidenced that he understood at last the trend of her daring purpose. The answer came slowly, but it came. "'I will. But what?' Her hand rose in a pleading gesture. Do not ask me, but take Arthur and myself into the garden and show us the flowers. Afterwards, I should like a glimpse of the sea. He bowed, and they joined Arthur, who had already begun to stroll the grounds. Violet was seldom at a loss for talk, even at the most critical moments. But she was strangely tongue-tied on this occasion, as was Roger himself. Save for a few observations casually thrown out by Arthur, the three passed in a disquieting silence, through pergola after pergola, and around beds gorgeous with every variety of fall flowers, till they turned a sharp corner and came in full view of the sea. Ah! <sighs> fell in an admiring murmur from Violet's lips as her eyes swept the horizon. Then they settled on a mass of rocks jutting out from the shore in a great curve. She leaned towards her host and softly whispered, The promontory? He nodded and Violet ventured no further, but stood for a little while gazing at the tumbled rocks. Then, with a quick look back at the house, she asked him to point out his father's window. He did so, and as she noted how openly it faced the sea, her expression relaxed, and her manner lost some of its constraint. As they turned to re-enter the house, she noticed an old man picking flowers from a vine clambering over one end of the piazza. "'Who was that?' she asked. "'Our oldest servant, and my father's old man.' was Roger's reply. He is picking my father's favorite flowers, 
a few late honeysuckles. How fortunate! Speak to him, Mr. Upjohn. Ask him how your father is this evening. Accompany me, and I will. And do not be afraid to enter into conversation with him. He is the mildest of creatures and devoted to his patient. He likes nothing better than to talk about him. Violet, with a meaningful look at her brother, ran up the steps at Roger's side, and as she did so, the old man turned, and Violet was astonished at the wistfulness with which he viewed her. "'What a dear old creature,' she murmured. "'See how he stares this way. You would think he knew me.' "'He is glad to see a woman about the place. He has felt our isolation. "'Good evening, Abram. Let this young lady have a spray of your sweetest honeysuckle. "'And, Abram, before you go, how was father tonight?' Still sitting up? Yes, sir. He is very regular in his ways. Nine is his hour. Not a minute before, and not a minute later. I don't have to look at the clock when he says, There, Abram, I've sat up long enough. When my father retires before his time, or goes to bed without a final look at the sea, he will be a very sick man, Abram. That he will, Mr. Roger. That he will. But he's very feeble tonight. Very feeble. I noticed that he gave the boy fewer kisses than usual. Perhaps he was put out because the child was brought in half hour earlier than the stated time. He don't like changes. You know that, Mr. Roger. He don't like changes. I hardly dared to tell him that the servants were going out in a bunch tonight. I'm sorry, muttered Roger, but he'll forget it by tomorrow. I couldn't bear to keep a single one from the concert. They'll be back in good season, and meantime we have you. Abram is worth half a dozen of them, Miss Strange. We shall miss nothing. Thank you, Mr. Roger. Thank you, faltered the old man. I tried to do my duty. And it was with another wistful glance at Violet, who looked very sweet and youthful in the half-light, he pottered away. The silence which followed his departure was as painful to her as to Roger Upjohn. When she broke it, it was with this decisive remark. That man must not speak of me to your father. He must not even mention that you have a guest tonight. Run after him and tell him so. It is necessary that your father's mind should not be taken up with present happenings. Run. Roger made haste to obey her. When he came back, she was on the point of joining her brother, but stopped to utter a final injunction. I shall leave the library, or wherever we may be sitting, just as the clock strikes half-past eight. Arthur will do the same as by that time he would feel like smoking on the terrace. Do not father either him or myself, but take your stand here on the piazza, where you can get a full view of the right-hand wing without attracting any attention to yourself. When you hear the big clock in the hall strike nine, look up quickly at your father's window. What you see may determine, Oh, Arthur, still admiring the prospect? I do not wonder. But I find it chilly. Let us go in. Roger Upjohn, sitting by himself in the library, was watching the hands of the mantel clock slowly approaching the hour of nine. Never had silence seemed more oppressive, nor his sense of loneliness greater. Yet the boom of the ocean was distinct to the ear, and human presence no farther away than the terrace where Arthur Strange could be seen smoking out his cigar in solitude. The silence and loneliness were in Roger's own soul and in face of the expected revelation which would make or unmake his future. The desolation they wrought was measureless. To cut his suspense short, he rose at length and hurried out to the spot designated by Miss Strange as the best point from which to keep watch upon his father's window. It was at the end of the piazza, where the honeysuckle hung, and the odor of the blossoms so pleasing to his father well nigh overpowered him, not only by its sweetness, but by the memories it called up. Visions of that father as he looked at all the stages of their relationship passed in a bewildering maze before him. He saw him as he appeared to his childish eyes in those early days of confidence, when the loss of the mother cast them in mutual dependence upon each other. Then a sterner picture of the relentless parent who sees but one straight course to success in this world and the next. Then the teacher and the matured advisor, and then, oh, bitter change! the man whose hopes he had crossed, whose life he had undone, and all for her who now came stealing upon the scene with her slim, white, jeweled hand forever lifted up between them. And she! Had he ever seen her more clearly? Once more the dainty figure stepped from fairyland, 
beauteous with every grace that can allure and finally destroy a man as he saw he trembled and wished that these moments of awful waiting might pass and the test be over which would lay bare his father's heart and justify his fears or dispel them for ever but the crisis if crisis it was was one of his own making and not to be hastened or evaded with one quick glance at his father's window he turned in his impatience toward the sea whose restless and continuous moaning had at length struck his ear what was in its call to-night that he should thus sway towards it as though drawn by some dread magnetic force he had been born to the dashing of its waves and knew its every mood and all the passion of its song from the frolicsome ripple to melancholy dirge but there was something odd and inexplicable in its effect upon his spirit as he faced it at this hour grim and implacable a sound rather than a sight it seemed to hold within its invisible distances the image of his future fate what this image was or why he should seek for it in this impenetrable void he did not know he felt himself held and was struggling with this influence as with an unknown enemy when there rang out from the hall within the preparatory chimes for which his ear was waiting and then the nine slow strokes which signalized the moment when he was to look for his father's presence at the window had he wished he could not have forborne that look had his eyes been closing in death or so he felt the trembling lids would have burst apart at this call and the revelations it promised and what did he see what did that window hold for him nothing that he might not have seen there any night at this hour his father's figure drawn up behind the panes in wistful contemplation of the night no visible change in his attitude nothing forced or unusual in his manner even the hand lifted to pull down the shade moves with its familiar hesitation in a moment more that shade will be down and but no the lifted hand falls back the easy attitude becomes strained fixed he is staring now not merely gazing out upon the wastes of sky and sea and roger following the direction of his glance stares almost in breathless emotion at what those distances but now so impenetrable are giving to the eye a spectre floating in the air above the promontory the spectre of a woman of his wife clad as she had been clad that fatal night outlined in supernatural light it faces them with lifted arms showing the ends of ropes dangling from either wrist a sight awful to any eye but to a man of guilty heart ah it comes the cry for which the agonized son had been listening an old man's shriek hoarse with the remorse of sleepless nights and days of unimaginable regret and foreboding it cuts the night it cuts its way into his heart he feels his senses failing him yet he must glance once more at the window and see with his last conscious look but what's this a change has taken place in the picture and he beholds not the distorted form of his father sinking back in shame and terror before this visible image of his secret sin but that of another weak old man falling to the floor behind his back abram the attentive seemingly harmless guardian of the household abram who had never spoken a word or given a look in any way suggestive of his having played any other part in the hideous drama of their lives than that of the humble and sympathetic servant the shock was too great the relief too absolute for credence he the listener at the grotto he the avenger of the family's honor he the insurer of little roger's continuance with the family at a cost the one who loved him best would rather have died himself than pay yes there was no misdoubting this old servitor's attitude of abject appeal or the meaning of homer upjohn's joyfully uplifted countenance and outspreading arms the servant begs for mercy from a man and the master is giving thanks to heaven why giving thanks has he been the prey of cantankering doubts also has the father dreaded to discover that in the son which the son has dreaded to discover in the father it might easily be and as roger recognizes this truth and the full tragedy of their mutual lives he drops to his knees amid the honeysuckles violet you are a wonder but how did you dare this from arthur as the two rode to the train in the early morning 
the answer came a bit waveringly i do not know i am astonished yet at my own daring look at my hands they have not ceased trembling since the moment you threw the light upon me on the rocks the figure of old mr upjohn in the window looked so august arthur with a short glance at the little hands she held out shrugged his shoulders imperceptibly it struck him that the tremulousness she complained of was due more to some parting word from their young host than from prolonged awe at her own daring but he made no remark to this effect only observed abram has confessed his guilt i hear yes and he will die of it the master will bury the man and not the man the master and roger not the little fellow but the father we will not talk of him said she her eyes seeking the sea where the sun in its rising was battling with a troop of lowering clouds and slowly gaining the victory end of problem four the grotto spectre part two